Okay, so you expect that time of day when every vendor runs from a room because they think I'm going to be rude about them. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> and as last year I did um, Dear Vendor, where I was rude about them. You can talk about, look, this is a sequel. So price of everything, value of nothing. So Enrico asked me to talk about this. Um, we talked about appropriate measures for when you're comparing storage when you're purchasing new storage systems. Um, you'll find there's lots of complex TCO calculations out there. How do we do it? How do we really do it? Or do we just go back to a simple, how much does it cost me to buy a gigabyte of storage? Now, I was talking to Howard about this last night. He says, well, different, different storage differs. So one of the things I always say, you'll find yourself, you should be comparing tiers. So you shouldn't be saying comparing a dollar per gigabyte of a spinning rust system versus a dollar per gigabyte of a flash array. So, this is reality. Storage budgets continue to fall. Data growth still continues to go through the roof. Um, some go to cloud, the magical cloud. A lot doesn't. When we get into refreshes, everybody expects it to do for less. Um, at the moment, we're looking at a company I work for, we're looking at doing a refresh after five years, and we expect to buy four times as much storage at least four times as much storage as we did last five years, but for the same budget. And this is reality. People always talk about storage and cloud being elastic. I haven't come across a case where somebody says, tell you what, all that storage you bought five years ago, we now need less. It always grows. So, there you go. Technology is going to save us all. Rotation rust gets ever larger. Flash, cheaper, faster. Much faster, better. Lots and lots of smart stuff in storage. Dedupe, compression. Do we all believe that? Do we actually believe that technology is going to save our storage budgets? I'm not sure. And do we think it's actually going to make our lives any easier when we're comparing? No. And the cloud? No, the cloud doesn't make anything perfect. It just makes it worse. Private, public, hybrid. If anybody believes there's such thing as hybrid. So, one of the things I love, Dilbert, I don't know why I put this one up, I just quite liked it. There you go. More and more data, let's pay more and more money. Money, money, money. This is all about cash. So, how many people in the room actually buy storage? Anybody done any purchasing recently? <coughs> no? Well, I can talk you through the process, because this is the process as it works. Somebody comes along and says, I need some storage. So you sit down, you have a think, come a price, you go to finance, if you have a big finance department, say, and they agree, you agree a budget. And then you say, right, now I've got the money, that's ready. I know what I want a lot of the time. So you try and spend it. And then finance come back and said, yeah, I know, I know, that's what we said. But what we really want you to do is spend half of that. Okay. I'll have another discussion, I'll see what I can do. I'll go and try and spend it again. You get to a stage where you might be raising a PO or you're doing something along those lines. And then procurement has to get involved because you have to take it competitive. Now, this is where it gets fun because then as soon as you go competitive, you are in a world of RFPs, making comparisons and justifying the decision you made at the top. So, <coughs> issue RFP, RFP goes out, get it back, everybody sits in a sealed room, marks the RFP, and surprise, surprise, nine times out of ten, the thing which you win the RFP is the thing you wanted to win it in the first place. Well, if you let me break the RFP, I'm going to win the RFP. We never let vendors break the RFP. Why would we let consultants or vendors anywhere near an RFP? I know some people do, it's a bad idea. So, you issue RFP, you ask a load of questions. Now, the problem is, and it almost goes back to Howard's benchmarking as well, everybody has different measures, some people will quote benchmark X or benchmark Y, some people say we don't like benchmark X, so we're not going to respond to that question. Then everybody sort of starts saying, well, we do that flash, 
Then somebody says, well, you've asked for space, but what's your IOP density? Really important. A lot of time you don't know. Then you're getting questions about dedupe, is it real space, raw disk, what you're getting into, thin provisioning. Then you get to vendor X will quote with maintenance. Then you say, actually, I want four years maintenance, or I want... And everything just ends up completely wonky, not level, you don't know. And it's also just ask one question, a simple question to any vendor, to six, six vendors. A, they won't answer the question. They'll answer the question they wanted to be asked. And they'll answer that question in a completely different way to vendor Y. So you're sat there with a form which was supposed to normalize and level the playing field, which doesn't make any comparison. So that's the reality of RFP. They're great fun, great way of spending time in meeting rooms and talking to vendors and getting asked stupid questions. So you should define what you want. You need to define it. But how many people have actually been involved in writing requirements for a storage array? Yeah? So what sort of things do you actually put in it, Howard? Capacity, resilience, performance, phase of the moon. If I want <laughs> vendor A to win, then I specify features using their names. <laughs> but storage arrays don't exist. They just exist. They exist to um, support applications. So how do you then start writing requirements for a, an array which may be running half a dozen, half a, half a dozen different applications? Look at the service levels you want to offer. Hmm? Isolation yeah. capabilities. Yeah. And then finance come along. They're not that interested in all that. They just want it for as low as you possible you can. So that conflicts. Vendors, they will talk to you about features. That's all they want to do. And they'll be saying, oh, that feature allows you to meet that requirement. Despite it doesn't, or the fact, the fact that you don't actually really want that, or they don't necessarily understand. I've had vendors try to sell me compression systems to store video files. Not great. And of course, the people who work for you, the storage teams, they just want it the same as the last time really, but you don't want to go through a whole load of change. So all those requirements just tend to completely clash. And then, and then somebody will say, oh, you should be looking at the whole cost, not just the cost of procuring the storage. So, people costs. Well, I've never been allowed to increase my people costs when I bought new storage. I don't very often decrease them either. Environmental costs, management costs, migration. But migration is very much the same. It doesn't matter what system you go. If you're going from, the, I'll pick on HDS because I picked up on this. If you go from an HDS to an HDS array, it's not that dissimilar. Going from an HDS to an IBM array, your migration costs are very, very similar. Certainly these days, lots of people have now moved away from doing clever array level migrations. Most people tend to do it at a volume level. Storage vMotion. Yeah. So or vMotion or Veritas disk mirroring, something like that. You very rarely do you actually copy at an array level. It happens sometimes. Bad behaviors. Well, how on earth do you cost bad behaviors into a TCO? <coughs> Why will buying a new storage array or changing your array provider improve your the behavior of people, it doesn't. So I'll argue that 80% of costs associated with storage are nothing to do with yet. Absolutely agree with that. But those 80% of costs will be the same whatever storage array you, you purchase, generally. So it's a wash. It's quite a good book, though. It's worth, it's worth reading to actually understand where some, some of the vendors are coming from. And it'll give you some idea. So when a CFO or a CIO challenges on your storage costs, you can actually say, look, well, all that is a wash. So, there you go. All it ends up is a big headache as you start building all these metrics. Yeah? All anybody ever wanted to do was buy a bit of storage. 
one terabyte, 10 terabytes, 10 petabytes, whatever. But now you have a graph, or you have some metrics, and everything's pointing, well, I still don't know what to buy. I only have six dimensions, Yeah, 11, because, I mean, I, but, yeah, at the moment, people are saying 11 doesn't, isn't real anyway, Howard. Nigel. You know how you say that it's very rare for people to use like um, features of the storage array to do migrations now. We, we've started using mm. tools at like the host level or higher up the stack here. Yeah. Um, when, when you're putting an RFP out now, or, or even just in general, right, like the kind of advanced features that you used to or that you can get with storage arrays, like, you know, snapshots with software that's built into XYZ. Um, software-based snapshots as well. Are all of those things of value these days? Okay. I, so snapshots are of value. Clones value. Replication may be of value. It's becoming less of value, but valuable. Certainly synchronous replication has become less valuable. Certainly as people begin to understand that synchronous replication doesn't necessarily give them what they want, which is instantaneous failover to another array, no, it gives you a crash consistent copy of your Oracle database or, or whatever, and you still might try and bring it up, and it still may take as many hours as you didn't want. You may actually be better off with an async replication. But some vendors who have got spe specific plugins, like things like the exchange level plugins for managing snapshots and things, they're becoming less useful. The applications themselves may be handling this a bit better. Um, so we don't generally look for specific application level integration. Because back in the day when I was writing storage RFPs and things, I'm probably guilty of them being almost like not just a feature tick list, mm. but it was like a race to see who had the most features, yeah. yet they didn't necessarily give that much value. No, you're right. There's so much shelfware or virtual shelfware oh, yeah. in an array which you just have never used. I, yeah, we've all, we've all been guilty of it. And often, Nigel, you probably can, you can spot the RFP which has been written by the storage team who want to keep a particular vendor, who want to move to a particular vendor. We're all guilty of it. We all either want to change or we want to keep the same. So one of the key skills in writing an RFP is actually how you neutralise that unconscious bias. I'd like to uh, elaborate on that uh, because as storage guys, you, you take the storage for central and you don't uh, interested in the application because, and if you take a look at today's application, that they become more uh, rich and more uh, redundant. And if it, an application scales itself, why try to fix it in the storage system? Because the data integrity lies within the application and the application owner. And if it's already justified over there, so why in inter invest in features in a storage system? Because you don't have to. No, that's so absolutely. the only way those features are there for the, those dumb applications who don't have those capabilities. You do have to remember that most of the applications within an enterprise, certainly space we te I tend to play in, and I expect quite a lot of people to are still relatively dumb. There's still an awful lot of legacy, heritage, whatever you want to call them, applications out there. There's still an awful lot of Oracle databases out there. There's still an awful lot of SQL Server databases in there. There's a lot of traditional applications out there. It's probably one of the problems I think a lot of enterprise architects or people involved in enterprise have with a lot of the story around cloud is that there is this assumption you can move things to cloud and cloud is going to take over, so when we end up with bimodal IT, which is a silly idea in many ways, but we have to accept the reality, we do have these applications, some which are toxic, because they are just horrible, there is so much technical debt built into them, but you can't move off them, and some which are proper line of business, very important to the business, and you're probably not going to move off them anytime soon. Things like exchange, we'll see less of as people move more and more of our exchange environments into Office 365. Um, let Microsoft run your email environment for you. They're experts at it. Just let them do it. You don't want to be doing that. There's no value in it unless you're an Office 365 provider. But, but 
but in essence, you have to talk to the application guy. Um, because yeah. if you want See, to. See, this is it. Now you've gone to my last slide and ruined my, yeah. <laughs> my presentation. <laughs> but I shall, I shall persist. So you do end up, and then if you have questions, of, I talk to the people who deal with servers. Oh, it's really easy. What, why are you messing about with this? Because servers are really easy to buy. Until you say, well, why aren't you buying HDI if you compared HDI and things like that? Then they all shut up really quickly. But, but if you're comparing Dell to HP or whoever else is out there at the moment, it's a relatively easy thing to do because they're all the same. They're just Intel servers. I've probably upset half the people in the room because people, certainly server vendors don't like to, well, no, they're special. No, I can pretty much run anything I want on them. So you end up with metrics, so too many metrics, you can't deal with them anymore. And you produce these wonderful spreadsheets which show TCOs and show investment. And eventually you like the guy in the scanners and your head explodes. So there is a secret. So first of all, really simplify everything. So you mentioned, we talked talk about requirements, and actually no, it's not such a bad way of going it, so I just need this many IOs, I need this much space, and just keep it at that level. You'll have a vague idea whether it's gonna be random, 60, 40. You know generally what your applications are already performing, and if you've got a new application, you should be able to have a discussion. To say, what does it perform like? What is it like we've already got? Yeah, I mean, the developers are always saying, it's yeah. gonna be five times as successful yeah. as it will, so you yeah. end up with that. So, de-duping compression, we generally normalize across the piece. We just go for, a, for general purpose of IT, just if you're running a mixed workload, we generally stick around 1.6. That may be conservative. Uh, yeah, it's conservative. And the only comment I would have about de-duping and compression is that everyone says they do it. Yeah. And specifically the HCI environment, yeah. there are compromises you have to make to make the storage layer fit in a VM. So no HCI vendor is ever going to do dedupe as well as a dedicated storage vendor yeah. because that last 30% of dedupe takes a huge amount of memory mm. and you can't afford to go, well, when I need 128 gig of memory in every node to run HCI. Generally, another piece I would say is get the vendor to sign up to something they're comfortable with. 1.6, you find most vendors are fairly comfortable with as an idea because it protects them and you. Because one of the things you will find is, when well, certainly we've done in compression, you, you've made some assumptions about how well your data compresses, and then you discover that your local DPAs have turned on a column level compression, so all your compression stuff's gone. Because why, why wouldn't you? In some cases, it makes your databases perform better and CPU is cheap. But Oracle licensing isn't. Yeah, true. Um, yeah, again, I'm sure Howard will agree with this. Performance tends to be similar, although, well, it'll be interesting to see what benchmarking Howard comes up with when he gets this going. Edge cases are interesting. Don't get who hung up on edge cases. Not very many people will be dealing with edge cases. We've got some oddities in the environment I manage, but most of you, most, most compute workloads are about the same. Environmentals, well, a, a spinning disk is a spinning disk. You can just go, oh, I've got 100 of those, so 100 of those running that array will probably be very similar to 100 rows running in, in, in another array. But generally, if you pack full of Xeon servers or memory, you can work out this, and you'll find there's very little difference, even when you're dealing with flash. So that brings you down to that question. Question's easy, will this work for my use case and how much cash leaves the business in the cycle I care about? So, there you go. The answer is yes, you boil it down to a dollars per gigabyte. <coughs> Forget about any other metric. Finance aren't interested in it. Procurement aren't in inter interested in anything else. And your boss is interested in this. That's all he cares about. He wants to know that you're in or under budget. That, that is dollars per gigabyte, assuming adequate performance, yeah. right? Yeah. Assuming it will, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so it's pick a class, yeah. you know, I need all flash performance, then dollars yeah. per gigabyte. Yeah. yeah. I uh, can buy that. Uh, have I run out of time? No. I have, some other, I have some other comments on this. 
So I've another question for you. Why is that significant number significant in all your procurement decisions? Anybody? That is the distance of the sun from the earth, which defines how long a year is. So. Now, a year is actually not long enough for us to really make any sensible decisions. The problem is every business we work for is driven by a 365-day reporting cycle. It's just too short to make strategic decisions. I'm in the US. It's every quarter. Well, not necessarily. It depends. Depends if you're a public company or a private company, doesn't it? Or you have to report. But it's, it, it is that distance. So actually, if you want to make more strategic decisions, all you have to do is move the earth. <laughs> if you can move it about, I don't know, so it, it, a year is about 500 days long, that will enable you to make much more sensible decisions. Uh, I don't know if any of you have ever come across a, a chat with Simon Wardley, who's written quite, you know Simon, Nigel. We had, a long, we had a, a long conversation about this, and he thinks actually that's one of the better ways of managing them. TCO may be to move the earth. It would help with global warming. But one of the things is, how do you break this? So firstly, don't come up with, as I say, no, up, no complex TCO models. Buy yourself some time, just dollars per gigabyte. Easy. Then, as I say, Talk to developers. Learn where you want to be. A nice map. Actually decide where you want to be in three, four years' time and work out how you're going to get there. Whether that's going to be, I'm going to half the cost of my storage or I'm going to be able to provision storage any quicker. Just think about where you want to be. Cost. Don't worry about cost. And if people encourage you to try and make cost reduction your strategy, don't. Just avoid that like the play, because that will just incur a, a race to the bottom, which dollars gigabytes doesn't necessarily help, but you don't want that race to the bottom, because you will find that there's an easy way of cutting your costs at that point, and that probably normally leaves you, involves you leaving the organisation. And this is also some reality. So, infrastructure teams, storage teams, anybody working in ops, will always struggle to show business value. Businesses won't value you. So, <coughs> so buddy up with teams. Now, these are your developers. So go and talk to the developers. Find out what they want to do, how they're working things. Whether they're looking for stuff with APIs, what they're looking at. For some reason, developers often seem to have a lot more time to be poking around the industry saying, that's cool, that's cool, that's not cool. Now, it may be the nature <coughs> of the different personalities you get in the teams. But they're, they're great. And you have to become like their oxygen. You have to, they have to realize that without you, they no longer work. Now, it's difficult with public clouds there. But even with public clouds, still, they still need infrastructure teams of some sort because most of them aren't very good at running operating systems. They're not very good at thinking about security. So your comment, Nigel, was about our containers secure. I don't think the container is inherently secure, but it much makes it much easier for application developers to deploy insecure applications. Because they'll just bundle it in, roll it out, and next thing you know, not only have you got one, you've got 4,000 attack fronts. <laughs> and talk to them, keep feeding new technologies that will change the way they work and you'll probably find that you survive and you can actually show value. That's it. It's done. Questions? Any questions? <coughs> no upset vendors. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. This is the first time. Yeah.